Welcome everyone to the worship of Sleaford Methodist Circuit. Before we get into our worship today, I'm hoping you will be able to help me out with what the future of these YouTube recordings are going to look like. We are at the moment returning to worship in our churches across the circuit and most churches now are actually meeting week by week still with limited uh, abilities and limited ways of doing things but we are meeting on a Sunday together in person. I've found that people um, from what they've said uh, consider these YouTube videos to be quite helpful but I'm really looking for guidance on how helpful. I'm not fishing for compliments here, don't get me wrong. I've already had a lot of good, very positive feedback, which is, which is very encouraging. But looking to the future, is it helpful to have a weekly YouTube recording of worship that you can join in with and watch at home or not? Um, if you want to leave comments below, then please do. If you want to be more private, because comments below will be there in public, um, email me. Uh, I'll put the um, email across the screen at the bottom here, uh, if you don't already know it. So email me and, and let me know what you think. What I'm looking for here is guidance as to how many people are really finding these uh, videos helpful and valuable. Uh, if, if there are people who are finding them useful, then we, we will carry on with them even into the future and even as life perhaps returns something more like to normal. Um, but I, I don't know. I don't know how widespread these videos are going. Are you watching from outside the circuit? Are you unable to get to church and finding that these are helpful because it's your only way of worshipping God. Um, as I say, I'm just looking for, for guidance here. We'll certainly continue for a little longer at the very least, but long term, well, what do you think? Let me know. Okay, but uh, for now, we're here to worship and we turn our thoughts to God. We're going to um, uh, start with a prayer of praise, but also I think it's a uh, high time we, we need a prayer of protection for our nation, our world, our churches and the people that we care about. Let us pray. Lord God, we give you praise and thanks for your many, many blessings to us. We take too little time pausing from our uh, active lives to say thank you for the good things that we take for granted day by day, food to eat, shelter to keep us safe. We thank you, Lord, for your love shown in Jesus, the greatest love of all, the love which laid down his life for us, which gave up um, life itself, going through a painful and agonizing death to set us free. We thank you, Lord God, for the sacrifice of Jesus and for his living presence in our lives. You are indeed a glorious and wonderful saviour, Lord Jesus. We praise you for it. And we pray for your protection to be over us as our nation comes out of a, a time of lockdown and discovers more freedom and yet with worries about where that might lead. Lord, help us, watch over us. But not just our nation, we pray for the world because the, this pandemic is a, a, a situation which has affected other countries and is affecting other countries far greater than, than us. Lord, keep our world safe. Bring us through this. Help us to, to work together, to care for one another and to meet this crisis in a way that builds up the nations. Lord, bless our world and protect our world, we pray. And we pray for those who are close to us, the people that we love, the people that we care most about, for those who are going through whatever kind of need or problem, whether it's a physical illness or whether it's 
anxiety or sadness, Lord, where there is need, come with your healing presence and your comforting arms to surround and uphold and protect. We pray all this in the name of Christ, our Lord and Saviour. Amen. And we're going to sing, and I found song, uh, a hymn from Hymns and Psalms, which uh, the words fit what I'm going to be saying a bit later, or at least I think they do, but it's not a particularly well-known hymn, and there's no other set tune that, that fits this. So what I'll do is I'll display the words of the first verse and I'll play through the tune once so you can match up the words to the tune on your own before uh, we actually sing the words. Uh, Shine thou upon us, Lord, the world's true light today. It's number 560 if you actually want to look it up for yourself in hymns and psalms. Let's praise God together. So we come to our set gospel reading for this Sunday. And this is a, a reading about a man who was widely regarded as a prophet who was put to death. It's about a ruler who was reluctant to put this man to death, but in the end went along with the crowd to please them. It's about a man who was put to death, placed in a tomb, by his disciples and yet was believed by some to have been raised from the dead and returned to life and it's not about the man who you think it's about if you're thinking of Jesus it's actually about a man called John often called the Baptist I'm going to read from Matthew chapter 7 and verses, uh, sorry, it's chapter 6, verses 14 to 19 to 29. Matthew 6. I'm going to... I'm going to read from uh, 
Mark chapter 6, verses 14 to 29. King Herod heard about this. For Jesus' name had become well known. Some were saying, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. And that is why miraculous powers are at work in him. Others said he is Elijah. And still others claimed he is the prophet, like one of the prophets of long ago. But when Herod heard this, he said, John, the man I beheaded, has been raised from the dead. For Herod himself had given orders to have John arrested, and he had had him um, bound and put in prison. He did this because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, whom he had married. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. So Herodias nursed a grudge against him and wanted to kill him. But she was not able to because Herod feared John and protected him, knowing him to be a righteous and holy man. When Herod heard John, he was greatly puzzled, yet he liked to listen to him. Finally, the opportune time came. On his birthday, Herod gave a banquet for his high officials and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. When the daughter of Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his dinner guests. The king said to the girl, ask me for anything you want and I'll give it to you. And he promised her with an oath, whatever you ask, I will give you up to half my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, what shall I ask for? The head of John the Baptist, she answered. At once the girl hurried into the king with the request. I want you to give me right now the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was greatly distressed, but because of his oaths and his dinner guests, he did not want to refuse her. So he immediately sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. The man went beheaded John in prison and brought back his head on a platter. He presented it to the girl and she gave it to her mother. On hearing of this, John's disciples came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. In many ways, John the Baptist is seen as a, a forerunner of Jesus. And I think Mark is here preparing the way for the story of Jesus because John is following the same path or following the path first and then Jesus follows the same path, killed unjustly, laid in a tomb. And yet there's something slightly different here. I want to focus really on the, the first bit of that passage where Herod, amongst others, is convinced that John the Baptist is risen. He has heard of this man, Jesus, preaching and doing miracles around Galilee, and he thinks, this is John, raised from the dead. John, who I had beheaded, put in the tomb, and he's back again. Now, it's quite an unusual thing to believe, especially within the Jewish faith. Not all Jews by any means believed in resurrection. There was some argument about it between the Pharisees and the Sadducees who were on different sides in that argument. And those who did believe in the resurrection of the dead believed that it would be an event that happened right at the end of time when God gathered all those who died, raised them and judged them. This idea of someone who died coming back again, straight away pretty much, well, it's more like the Eastern ideas of, uh, of um, reincarnation. Uh, uh, the same person or the same personality, the same soul or spirit in a different body. 
uh, which is an unusual kind of thing to, to believe, uh, at least in those days and in that age. But this idea that John the Baptist wasn't dead and gone, he'd been raised, he was still active, I think this gives us something of an insight into the relationship between prophets and kings, between those who speak for God and those in positions of power. Before exploring that uh, further, let's have another passage before we uh, return then to uh, John and Herod. And this is from the prophet Amos, and it's chapter 7, verses 7 to 15. Uh, Amos is speaking and he's describing one of a series of, of visions. This is what he showed me. The Lord was standing by a wall that had been built true to plumb, with a, a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord asked me, What do you see, Amos? A plumb line, I replied. Then the Lord said, Look, I am setting a plumb line among my people, Israel. I will spare them no longer. The high places of Isaac will be destroyed and the sanctuaries of Israel will be ruined. With my sword, I will rise against the house of Jeroboam. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent a message to Jeroboam, king of Israel. Amos is raising a conspiracy against you in the very heart of Israel. The land cannot bear all his words, for this is what Amos is saying. Jeroboam will die by the sword, and Israel will surely go into exile away from their native land. Then Amaziah said to Amos, Get out, you seer. Go back to the land of Judah. Earn your bread there and do your prophesying there. Don't prophesy any more at Bethel, because this is the king's sanctuary and the temple of the kingdom. Amos answered Amaziah, I was neither a prophet nor a prophet's son, but I was a shepherd, and I also took care of sycamore fig trees. But the Lord took me from tending the flock and said, Go, prophesy to my people Israel. Thanks be to God for his word. I'm sure most of you are familiar with the concept of a plumb line. It's a way of determining when something is absolutely straight uh, and perfectly upright, up and down. And it's easy enough to construct a plumb line. All you need is um, a weight and a piece of string. Uh, I've created my own here. I say easy enough. The amount of time and effort it took me to get this string tied onto a uh, a heart-shaped rock without the it all twisting round and falling off or dangling in the wrong direction. I hope you admire the uh, the result. But here is a plumb line, and when you hold it and measure it against something, I've no idea as I'm doing this what background I'm going to put in here. So whatever background I'm holding it against, that line there, this line, is a true plumb line because um, that's what plumb lines do. They measure perfect uprights. And Amos's vision is uh, about God setting a plumb line against a nation and the nation doesn't measure up. The nation is out of kilter, it's out of true. It's not getting things right. And elsewhere, Amos explains why it is that the nation is, is failing. But it's a, a message that comes not from a professional prophet. There were professional prophets around in those days, much as there are professional clergy around these days. Uh, but Amos wasn't one of those. He was an ordinary working man, a shepherd, with um, a bit of an interest in looking after sycamore fig trees. And yet God laid on his heart the need to go to Israel uh, and to share with them this vision that a plumb line had been set against them and it wasn't showing them up well. It showed how much they had failed. And it's very easy to take a passage like this 
and see this as uh, this is God's truth spoken to people in power by ordinary folk and that it is the right and the duty and the calling of ordinary people to, to rise up and speak God's truth, whether it's to the, the government of the day or sometimes these days to the church. I get letters from time to time addressed to me as a representative of the, of the church, uh, although sometimes they're a little more personal than that, um, but I get letters from time to time that say, this is what God's truth is, this is how the church, or you personally, are not measuring up, shame on you. Well, that would be a very simplistic way of interpreting uh, this passage from Amos. You could use John the Baptist as another example of this, uh, because he spoke up against Herod. It was a business to do um, with his wife, criticising Herod uh, for marrying his brother's wife. But if you put all the emphasis on, well, here's God's truth, full stop, nothing else, you, you miss an, another important factor in this whole process, and that is the factor of conscience. I think it is important that Herod had a conscience. A conscience is what makes us understand the difference between right and wrong. We, we feel in our bones that certain things are okay, certain things are right, other things are not right. We, we have a moral code inbuilt into us. And I believe that is the spirit at work through our conscience speaking to us. And you can tell from Mark's account that Herod did have a conscience and it troubled him. Uh, he wasn't happy with having John beheaded. He didn't like what John had been saying, but he had some kind of respect, perhaps a bit of fear for him. He recognised who John was. And in the end, he, although he had this conscience, he didn't let it influence his decision. He would rather have John executed than lose face in front of the, all the, the crowds that he, he swore this oath and he wouldn't want to go back on that. But conscience is an important element in this. I know this from my experience. I am not going to share the major sins in my life on YouTube, but I'm happy to admit to one or two of the minor things that I get wrong. For example, taking too much bread out of the freezer for my lunchtime sandwiches. It may be, as it happens from time to time, that I am trying to be careful about how much I eat. And as lunchtime approaches, I need to get uh, the frozen bread or some slices of it from the freezer and set them aside ready for eating later when they've thawed. The number I take out can vary. And there are times when another person who's in the house might comment uh, on the fact that I've taken out too many. That can hurt at times. It gets to me. I, I feel deeply uh, about that. But the reason I feel deeply is because I know I have taken out too many. If I'm honest with myself, I, I, I know I've done it. And the reason I know is because when I set them aside, I, I didn't exactly hide them, but I, I, I put them just not so obvious so that anybody else in the house seeing them might not instantly be able to see how many there were and notice that perhaps there was one too many. Um, and because I've done that, I, I, I know I'm being a bit sneaky. I know I'm doing it wrong and being told so. It's not pleasant, but it, it, it's not pleasant because it, it triggers my conscience. I know I've got it wrong. It's not just the case of what's true, but what, what my conscience says is important. And it's that that motivates me not to get so many out the next day. 
because my, my conscience is the thing that's troubling me, as well as the obvious truth. If I wasn't worried about it, if my conscience was clear, I wouldn't care if people said, you've got too many or too few or whatever, because I'm just happy with the, the amount I've got. But when I know I'm doing wrong, it's not nice to be told so, but I probably need to be told so. This is what the case was with, with Herod. I, I don't actually know what was going on with Herod and his marriage, if I'm honest. I'm a bit puzzled because in the Old Testament, there, there are times when people were told it was their duty to marry their brother's wife or their brother's widow. If their brother died without having produced children, it was their duty to marry his widow and produce children on his behalf so that his line would not die out. And yet here, um, John is saying it's wrong to marry your brother's wife. Um, King Henry VIII is, an, is a, a, a similar case. He married his brother's uh, wife when his brother died, Catherine of Aragon. He was quite happy about it for a long time when it became politically expedient not to be married to Catherine. And that's when he decided that he'd done it wrong and, and his conscience started to trouble him then. But Herod's conscience clearly troubled him. I mean, whatever it was, whether it was, you know, because lust was involved or politics or something, I don't fully understand. But I, I do know that John was right. John was speaking the truth in this case, that Herod had done something bad. And Herod knew that John was right because he felt guilty about it. It, it struck his conscience. And when he was told um, that John... Uh, that Jesus was preaching in Galilee, he thought, this is it, it's John, back again, the voice of my conscience. I believe that when we are trying to work out a pattern for our behaviour, it's not enough just to ask what God's truth is, we also need to listen to the prompting of the Spirit in our conscience. And we have to be honest about both. Uh, we, we could ignore the plumb line, if you like, and uh, just do what we feel to be right. And that's not the right approach. We could stick to a, a very rigid plumb line and say, well, that's all that matters. And whatever our conscience is saying, uh, whatever the spirit seems to be saying, well, we're going to ignore that. We need to have both. Just following our conscience isn't good enough because that means we end up just doing what we feel is right. There has to be some external measure of what is right and what's wrong. And therefore we need the truth from God to, to help us. And sometimes it may take a long while for us to grasp that truth, both in our own lifetimes and beyond. If you look at the history of the church, you'll see that, that there are times when it has taken many centuries to grasp the real truth about what God wants from us. Two examples, slavery and the place of women in the church. For most of the life of the church, the 2000 years that the church has been in existence, slavery has been accepted as something that is normal. For most of that same period, it has been accepted that women have a, a lesser role within society and within the church. Paul said that women shouldn't be allowed to speak in church, and for many uh, that has remained the case. Uh, no, it's a, a man's world. It has taken a very, very long time for the truth that slavery is an abhorrence and not to be tolerated, that men and women are equal in status and both have an important voice in the life of the church and in the leadership of the church. Those truths we accept now, but it's taken a long, long time. And for all that time, or for most of that time, good Christian men and women with clear consciences were 
uh, holding to the, the idea of slaves or the patriarchal nature of society, and they didn't see anything wrong with it. It took uh, centuries before the spirit was able to prompt our conscience enough to open our eyes to what was true. It's not enough just to rely on conscience. There is truth out there, though at times it, it takes us a long time to see it. But it, it's not enough either just to be too rigid about the truth. I think sometimes, let's use the example of a plumb line. Sometimes people will um, use a plumb line. They'll take the sounding, they'll, they'll measure it, they'll get, this is true. Oh, but now we've got this, right, we can use this anywhere we like. Okay, so I'm going to measure over here like this. Uh, I'm going to measure uh, this, I'm going to measure that, all with the same plumb line. And suddenly it becomes a, almost a rigid thing that we forget needs to be checked every now and then. We need to retake our soundings every now and then. In this case, we need the, the prompting of the spirit to say, you know, look again, set that plumb line again, because perhaps the plumb line that you're working with is actually just a memory of a plumb line and a sounding that you took years ago. Look again, is it right? Are you still working to the truth? And in all this, honesty is the vital thing not trying to, to fool ourselves, but to be honest with ourselves, to be honest with God. I am willing to admit that at times I am sneaky about the amount of bread I take out of the freezer. And, I, and when I'm told I'm taking too much, I don't like it, but I recognise there is truth in that because my conscience tells me the same. We need to be absolutely honest with ourselves about the way we live. This summer, um, the Methodist Conference has received a report called God in Love Unites Us. And this report deals with attitudes towards marriage and relationships, particularly uh, around the area of sexual relationships, though not exclusively. It covers things like cohabitation, divorce, same-sex marriage. And the church uh, has been taking a fresh look at what are our standards? What do we think about these things? What is acceptable? What is not acceptable? What do we as a church say to people who are living together before marriage, wishing to divorce, wanting to marry in church in a same-sex relationship. How do we deal with those things? And you may or may not have been following all this closely, I don't know, but you can imagine that there are different views and very strongly held views on all sides. What this boils down to, I find, in, in this situation, as in many other situations within the church, is a variety of ways of understanding the Bible. On one extreme, you have those who say that every single word, every sentence of the Bible is 100% accurate and true. A very fundamentalist, uh, literally true approach to scripture. At the other extreme, you have people who say the Bible is a collection of books written a long time ago and it's of historical interest and some of the things that people say can be helpful, but ultimately we can freely ignore vast chunks of it if they're, they go against what modern life seems to say is right and proper. Both of those extremes I think, have no real place in the church. If we want to understand the Bible, we have to realise that it is both a physical book and a channel through which the Spirit works. We have not only the physical book, we have 
a living saviour, Jesus Christ. We have the Holy Spirit who is active in our lives. We have a relationship with Christ. And it is the, the physical written word and that relationship through which God speaks. The, the written word is fixed and, 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 and stable and it doesn't change. Anybody who picks up the Bible and reads it will read the same words. Admittedly, um, it's probably those who are Hebrew and Greek scholars who can read it in the original languages for whom that is literally true. Uh, many of us, we rely on um, it having been translated into our native language. And to that extent, it, the actual words do change a little bit as language changes and new translations are made. But substantially, the written word is fixed. But that relationship with Jesus, that working of the Spirit in our lives, that's a, a, a dynamic thing. And the same words sometimes spring to life in different ways as the Spirit speaks to us through our conscience. We need all the time both things. And admittedly, that still leaves quite a wide spectrum of views about the importance of the Bible. There are those who will put more emphasis on the written word and there are those who put more emphasis on the the living spirit and uh, our, our current context which is why we get different views on important subjects and we have to live with that but what i would say to you is be honest in terms of your view of scripture and uh, your dealings with Jesus through the, the Spirit prompting in your life. Just be utterly honest. Don't jump to false conclusions. Don't uh, run away with false ideas. Think it through. You may not be able to dictate the decisions of the Methodist Conference and may not agree with the decisions of the Methodist Conference, but you can decide what you're going to do in your life and how you are going to give your life. So listen to God's truth as revealed in the Bible. Listen to your conscience as the Spirit speaks to your heart. And when you find those two are in agreement, then that's how to live. That's how you find true life. Amen. A prayer that was, I think, originally written for the week of prayer for Christian unity it does seem appropriate uh, to, to close our, our worship today, although a hymn to follow. Let us pray. Lord, we pray for a church that is honest, that is ready to confess when it makes mistakes and confess the wrongs that have been done in its name and the shame it has brought on yours. May the Church of Jesus always live to honour him. Lord, we pray for a church that is open, where everyone who enters its doors is always aware of the warmth of its welcome, for a church more concerned for the hurting than for its rituals, more for the broken than for its own image. May the Church of Jesus always live to honour him. Lord, we pray for a church that is committed to worship, not content with simply the singing of hymns or the saying of prayers, a church where worship, prayer and adoration spring from hearts that know and love their Lord. May the Church of Jesus always live to honour him. Lord, we pray for a church that is ready to serve in your name, for a church that cares for the homeless, the lost and the broken, and seeks to reach out to those with no hope and no purpose, for a church that is at the heart of community and refuses to be sidelined or ignored, for a church that is the conscience of the nations and speaks prophetically the word that must be heard. May the Church of Jesus always live to honour him. 
Lord, we pray for a church that is focused on mission and whose purpose is that all may believe, for a church that preaches the gospel and demonstrates its truth through the lives of its people at home, at work and in the world, for a church committed to evangelism and whose every meeting and every committee is centred on Christ and bringing others to know him as Lord. May the church of Jesus always live to honour him. Lord, we pray for a church that is united in Christ, for a church that looks only to Jesus and has less time for pride and self-concern, for a church where its people are united, not just in word but in deed, for a church where there is love for each other, because first they have fallen in love with their Lord. May the Church of Jesus always live to honour him. Amen. And let's join together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. We didn't know that first hymn very well, I suspect but I'm sure you'll know this final hymn. Thou whose almighty word chaos and darkness heard and took their flight, let there be light. May now the blessing of God, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit rest upon you and remain with you always. Amen. <laughs>